Um, so do you guys have any questions on the cell cycle? You did P53, um, POGO of the cell cycle. Any questions so far? Oh, I had a question. Okay. Uh, do we need to know about the stem cells? Funny you should ask about stem cells. It's on our first slide. You got lots of different replaced every once in a while. Your taste buds, for instance, are replaced every 10 days or so. Skin cells are replaced every couple of weeks and liver cells turn over every 300 to 500 days. The cells that are doing the replacing of the old cells and the repairing of the damaged tissues are adult stem cells, also called somatic stem cells. The different sorts of cells, skin cells, liver cells, retina cells, muscle cells, intestine cells, they all have very specific jobs and they're built in very specific ways to do those jobs. Different shapes, sizes, contents. You can't just stick a muscle cell into a damaged liver and expect it to start breaking down your alcohol for you. Somatic stem cells, on the other hand, haven't decided what the heck they're gonna be. They're undifferentiated. They haven't specialized yet, like a college freshman, or let's face it, a recent college graduate. They have no idea what they're going to do with their lives. But just like there are different types of college graduates, there are different types of adult stem cells. Some can become more different kinds of things than others. Pluripotent stem cells can become many different types of cells all over the body. However, they're really hard to track down because there are so few of them in each organ or tissue. There are also multipotent adult stem cells, which are more common in the body, but restricted in the kind of cell that they can become. It's kind of like the difference between graduating from a trade school where you've been trained to do a few different possible jobs and graduating with a degree in philosophy or something equally unprepared for all jobs. So yeah, stick a pluripotent cell in a damaged liver and it just happily becomes a liver cell. Pretty cool. But there are some even better types of stem cells to be had, embryonic stem cells, which are also pluripotent. These are the cells inside a human embryo when it's a blastocyst, basically just a tiny nugget of human cells four or five days old, which is destroyed in the process of removing the stem cells from inside it. These embryonic cells are obtained from in vitro fertilization clinics that fertilize eggs outside of a mother's body for couples who are having trouble conceiving. Naturally, these clinics have some leftover fertilized eggs, so with the donor's permission, they're given to scientists doing stem cell research. Now, the main advantage of the embryonic stem cells is that while adult stem cells can be grown in culture for a time, meaning they can be made to multiply over and over in an solution, they can't grow for as long or as fast as the embryonic stem cells, which can be maintained indefinitely under the right conditions. After just six months in culture, a single wad of 30 embryonic stem cells will have yielded millions of stem cells, which can go on to develop pretty much into any type of cell in the body. Also, adult stem cells, if used in some sorts of transplant therapies, are more likely to be rejected than embryonic stem cells. Stem cell research is currently pretty hopping. Embryonic stem cells are being used by researchers all over the world to figure out how to repair or replace damaged cells and organs and create new drugs, but regulations have taken their toll. There are only about 35 stem cell lines or families of identical pluripotent stem cells that are available for federally funded research in America, whereas Europe has a couple thousand. So there, now you'll never have to mm, mm, your way through another news report about stem cells again. So I'm going to go through the cell cycle today talking about um, the phases um, in a little bit more detail, and then we're going to do um, Microscope slides, though we don't have microscopes, we're going to do them um, again virtually. So I have pictures of slides for you to look at and analyze. You need to know what each of the phases look like so you can count them up. Then you're going to do a little bit of analysis on a cancer versus um, non cancerous cells, do a little bit of graphing. And this is where I stalled out with my migraine. I wanted to go a little bit further with chi-square analysis, comparing the two to see if there is any statistical difference between the amount of time spent. Um, but I got halfway through that and couldn't finish. So we'll save chi-square for another day. Um, over the weekend, you just have a video to watch, please. Okay, so that's kind of a rundown of stem cells, just the concept that they can become any type of cell, um, they're undifferentiated. When they're in different environments, they'll receive like different cues and that'll turn on different genes because remember all of our cells have all of our genes. Um, so when you turn on a gene for the liver cells, then those genes will begin to be expressed. Interesting, I have, um, I had a knee surgery a couple years ago um, on the bottom 
of my femur bone, your big thigh bone, I have a pothole where there is absolutely no cartilage. So um, two bones rubbing against each other wear down the bone and create a, quite a bit of damage. Um, so you have um, some multipotent stem cells that are in your bone marrow because they're gonna become any type of um, blood cell or bone cell or um, cartilage cell. So anyways, they drilled holes in the bottom of my femur to release um, the, the marrow and the blood and the cells that are within that. And who knows, because I haven't, they haven't like MRI'd it since then, but um, supposedly those cells were supposed to um, connect with my cartilage cells. Remember we have that surface uh, receptors so they'll kind of identify what type of cells they should be. And then they're going to fill that gap. Remember the density dependency. So it should fill that pothole I have. Um, and they should find with the cartilage cells and begin to get those signals to um, express the cartilage genes. I don't know if it worked. My knee still hurts. Who knows? OK, so that's that about stem cells. All cells are going through. These three phases, which we kind of already introduced. The, um, so the first couple of slides are gonna feel like review. So of course we have interphase taking up the majority of the cell. Today you're going to use math to calculate what percentage of the cell cycle is used. Like we can generalize 95% of the cell. 95% of the cell cycle is in, cell, in uh, interphase, but like every cell is going to be a little bit different, right? So we can use math to calculate that. Um, mitosis and cytokinesis. So these are carefully controlled by proteins. We learned about cyclins and CDKs. And um, I have a little video on that, but I wasn't originally playing the stem cell video and I feel like you'd be videoed out if I show another one. But um, you can, I linked this in, and you can look at it later perhaps, but it's showing you how the CDK is binding with the cyclin. It shows the phosphorylation, talks about it turning on the next phase, and then um, the cyclin being degraded so that it can be recycled. And it talks about that CDK level staying pretty constant, and then the uh, cyclin level, because it's degraded after it's used, um, is re will appear in a cycling fashion, which you guys saw in the POGO. But I just watched one video, so I don't feel like doing another video. So today you guys are gonna look at some microscope slides. You have some of onion root tips and some of a fish blastula. So that's like a forming um, cell before it becomes a fish. Um, so anyways, we're gonna look at interphase under both of these. Notice I can't see any individual chromosomes. So to identify interphase, you basically have a blob within the cell. Um, you may or may not see the nucleolus, see the darker circle within the circle. So you may or may not see that. Pretty consistent um, in the length within the same type of cell, right? So the onion root tip is probably going to be different than the, than the fish blastula. 90, 95% of the time is spent in um, interphase. During this uh, phase, the cell itself is increasing in mass. So this one cell has to become two cells, right? So it's going to get bigger, bigger, bigger. It's going to make more cytoplasm. It's going to make more organelles. Um, it's going to create a second copy of your DNA. All of that's going to happen in order to maintain the chromosome number. When it splits in half, if you had 26 to begin with, you need two sets of 26, right? We don't want two sets of 13. So you saw how the cyclin is, is um, cycling and then degraded and the CDK is remaining pretty consistent. Um, you, you talked about or you read about that making that MPF, maturation promoting factor or mitosis promoting factor, depending on the resource, they might name it slight, slight, slightly different. But the concept of the CDKs is that they turn on the next cycle, the next phase of the cycle. They're like on off switches, right? So if things aren't going right, they should turn it off. The cell will either repair or exit the cell cycle for apoptosis, um, or the CDK will turn on the next phase and the cell cycle will continue. So G1 stands for gap. I usually think of it as growth because this is when it's getting bigger. This is when we're making 
copies of all of the material within the cytoplasm, our carbohydrates, our lipids, our proteins. Remember, we need all of those things for cell membranes for the next cell. We need proteins because most of our um, regulators of genes are proteins. Like you read about the, P the P53 gene, which codes for a P53 protein, which then acts as a transcription factor to turn on a set of genes, right? So we need to make copies of those proteins so that each cell can turn on the genes they need to turn on. Of course, every cell is going to need energy. Um, so these mitochondria and chloroplasts, remember, remember, they divide independent of the rest of the cell. We talked about endosymbiotic theory. The S phase, we're going to make copies of DNA. So now we're going to get into a little more detail of the DNA structure. Um, not the structure of the DNA, but how it is organized within a cell. So um, the DNA is the blue strands here, right? And it's wrapped around, around this red ball. That's called a histone. It's eight proteins combined together. So this is a way of compacting our DNA. Tightly coiled um, around these histones makes it so that more genetic material can fit in a teeny tiny cell, right? So versus if it was all stretched out, it would take up a lot of space. So that's one reason for this. Also, um, we wrap these genes up and the, when they're coiled tightly around histones, the genes are not available for transcription. And then when those genes are needed, you can loosen this coiling to make those genes available. We'll get into that in chapter 15. So the histones, um, are only going to be found in eukaryotic cells. So we refer to the DNA in prokaryotic cells as naked. So they are not wrapped around histones. <clears throat> so the histone plus the DNA together make up what's called a nucleosome. S-O-M-E means body. So this is a nucle nucleo body, basically. G2, um, we are going to check for errors, basically. So DNA has already been replicated. So you're going to be looking to make sure there is a copy of every single chromosome and that that genetic material is without um, errors like splices or um, maybe there's too many, not enough, things like that. So we're gonna produce proteins during G2 that drive mitosis. So mitosis serves different purposes for different organisms. So like this paramecium here is dividing into two and making a new organism entirely, right? Other organisms go through mitosis for growth and repair, like us. Somatic cells are body cells. So we talk about somatic cells and gametes. Gametes are our sex cells. They do not go through mitosis. Somatic cells, remember, I just said some is body. So these are body cells, your eyeballs, your liver, your muscles, all of those are somatic cells. So those types of cells go through mitosis for growth, repair, and replacement. Other organisms like yeast go through budding. Um, the, the paramecium is splitting into the amoeba, goes through binary fission. Um, this, I forget now what this is. It could be an algae, it could be a hydra. Perhaps it's a hydra. Anyways, it's going through um, it's going through mitosis to create new organisms as well. So the basics of mitosis is that is the division of the nucleus, right? Cytokinesis, cyto, cytoplasm, nucleus, um, nuclear division, mitosis. So you know PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Your book introduced a new one for you, the pre-metaphase. So I don't have that written right there. Um, but we're going to watch the dance of the chromosomes and see what happens to them. In early prophase, chromosomes are beginning to coil up and thicken, condense. So originally, they're in a form called chromatin. During interphase, you have chromatin, very thin, thread-like. As you saw in the image, you couldn't see individual chromosomes. So during prophase, these chromosomes begin to be visible. So when I look at these under the microscope, I think the nucleus looks kind of like it's polka dotted um, because the chromosomes are starting to 
condense, come together. So there's pieces called DNA topoisomerase. Hopefully you recognize ACE, A-S-E endings are um, enzymes, right? So they recognize incorrect tangling of DNA. As you get older, um, your levels of topoisomerase begin to dwindle. And that's where the aging process takes place. So it's no longer able to make those corrections. And you start to lose ends of your genetic material with each division of the cells. Cancer cells and stem cells have high levels of topoisomerase. So um, those cells have a greater lifespan. Um, so chromosomes are becoming visible. And sister chromatids are joined at a centromere. So sisters is a relationship. So identical copies are the sisters. When they are alone, they are not considered sisters because they don't have a copy, okay? But here they are together and so they are sisters. So this would be like a copy of chromosome number four. They are connected at a location called a centromere. So you see in the pinching inward here is the centromere. They are connected by a structure called the kinetochore. So that should be a new piece. We didn't talk about that first time around in ninth grade. So the kinetochore serves a purpose in holding them together as well as breaking down spindle fibers as they separate. Okay, so that's that. Here you can see chromosomes are attached to spindle fibers. So as prophase continues, the spindle, that's the whole apparatus, forms between centrioles. Remember, these are only present in animal cells. Um, plant cells don't have the centrioles. So they form uh, these spindle fibers, microtubules, that actually are pushing the ends of the cell apart. So this is elongating the cell, as well as you can see the chromosomes connected at the, the kinetochore is connecting, right, with those spindle fibers. Um, so you first have a nuclear membrane around your whole cell. And as prophase continues, the nuclear membrane begins to break apart and get stored in vacuoles or vesicles in order to be reassembled later. Um, just making connections between the centrioles, these also give rise to flagella and cilia, which are another form of microtubule more associated with movement. Okay, so these, these tubules are moving, um, both the cell ends away from each other as well as bringing those cells toward them or the chromosomes toward them. So during late prophase, um, the nuclear envelope breaks down and then it's stored in vesicles. So here I can see interphase, I see no particular chromosomes. I told you for me, prophase begins to look like a polka dotted nucleus. This, the membrane is beginning to break apart. You can see on the edges, right? So they're starting to be stored in vesicles. And then by the end of prophase, I can see full chromosomes. So the prometaphase is like a transition phase. It's orientating sister chromatids toward opposite poles. So, um, this, the chromatid is not the diagonal. Monsi. The, the chromatid is the like whole half, right? So you want to make sure the chromatids are on opposite sides. If they were like this, when you went to pull them apart, you wouldn't necessarily get one in each side. You might get half on each side. So you want to orientate it so you have full chromatids on both sides. And so that is what's happening during prometaphase. It's arranging the chromosomes and the chromatids, chromosome being the whole thing together, the chromatids in um, proper orientation. As metaphase continues, I now have proper orientation and um, they are aligned directly at the equator. So this should be a very small moment because not a lot is happening, right? It's like the midpoint. They're all aligned at the equator and they're ready to go. So during anaphase, ana is apart. So this is pulling the chromosomes apart. Um, to me, this looks like 
two octopus swimming away from each other and their legs are trailing behind them. That's what it looks like to me. The spindle is shortening and this is actually because of the kinetochores. Remember those spiky looking things that were holding them together? So as those fold back upon the spindles, those kinetochores break the spindle. And so that is causing the shortening of the spindle fiber itself. So it disassembles those microtubules. The sister chromatids are going to separate and move to opposite poles. Hopefully you get an exact copy on both sides. We can talk about non-disjunction later when they don't separate properly. Now that the sister is not paired, it is no longer called a sister. It is now a unique chromosome in its own new to be cell. And so now that individual is called a chromosome. So this can get tricky talking chromatid versus chromosome. So we talk about chromosomes until we've, or I mean chromatids until we've pulled them apart and now they're their own chromosome. During telophase, telo is end, telo, telo, doesn't matter, meta, uh, that's the only way you can say meta. Um, chromosomes <laughs> detach from the microtubules. Everything that happened in prophase is gonna unhappen, basically. So um, you had chromosomes thicken in prophase, they're gonna unthicken. They're going to unwrap and once again, be in that thin thread-like form of chromatin. Um, they're no longer attached to the microtubules. The vesicles that once contained the pieces of nuclear membrane that you broke down will come together. The vesicles come together, fusing to form a new nucleus. So a new nuclear membrane is formed. You now have two new nuclei. So here in this um, onion root tip, you can see two nuclei in a cell with a thin line between it. So you'll see various versions of this. Um, basically, telophase is gonna look like one long cell with two nucleus or two twin cells bumped up right next to each other. So depending on the phase of telophase, um, you'll have perhaps no plate at the very beginning and then a plate later. So this would is what happens in plant cells, they first, um, vesicles come together, just like the nuclear membrane, the vesicles contain um, cellulose and they will fuse together to form a plate. They release their cellulose on both sides. So now there's a cell wall on either side of that cell plate. So you'll have a cell plate and then later a wall on both sides. And then animal cells, we don't have the cell wall. So we have what is referred to as a cleavage furrow, basically a pinching inward in the middle of the cell. So you could picture if you had like a gelatinous ball, you could probably pinch in the middle, right? And bring your fingers together. That's pretty much what's happening. There's proteins that are involved in creating that pinching inward. So the cleavage furrow, which is basically indentation, begins between the two poles. And as it further, further deepens, um, eventually it'll cut the cell in half, right? So that is cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm. At this point, we've already divided the nuclei. These have two separate nuclei, so mitosis is over. So this is just an animation showing you what this would look like. I wish I could speed it up. You can see the chromosomes now, nuclear membranes gone, centrioles are forming. Centrioles are beginning to form spindle fibers. Sister chromatids are aligned at the equator. We are so close, good job. Pulled apart, anaphase. I can see mitochondria back there. Two nuclei. Two minutes.
and they continue to divide. So I, I always, I thought that was kind of a cool animation. Okay. So what I have in um, the Google world for you is a mitosis lab. So um, you will click on this to begin with. The division in cancer comes later. So this is gonna be a slide set. You will type right on your slide set. Um, this is an onion root tip. The meristem is this piece here. So growth is happening at the meristem. So this is where high amounts of um, mitosis is occurring. So if we were looking at this on the, under the microscope, we would zoom down to this area here. So we wouldn't wanna look up here because there's not a whole lot going on. So the root tip is growing downward, right? With gravity. Gravitropism, that's called growing towards gravity. So you'll, um, along the way, it has you click on a link for the pictures. So um, click on the Google Drive and you will have five slides. So this is, if you were looking at a microscope, five different views. So you can click on this one, um, open it up, see it as big as you want. And you're looking for different phases of mitosis, right? So all of these that look like just circles and you can't identify anything in particular, those are all gonna be interphase. Like I said, prophase looks like a nucleus that's broken up that has no particular pattern. So here, 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 these all look like a nucleus is starting to break apart, but there's no particular pattern of what's going on inside. So those are going to be prophase. Metaphase is lined up at the equator. To me, metaphase and anaphase are the easiest. Metaphase makes a line in the middle. Anaphase, I can see the trailing legs in this image here and this image here. So I can see the trailing legs going behind. Um, so that's gonna be anaphase. A telophase, let's look for a good telophase. Right here looks like a good telophase. Um, like these cells are about identical, right? Their size and their shape and their nucleus. So I would say that's going to be a telophase. This one looks like it's a telophase right here. Um, sometimes, they're easier to tell than others. So I might not have grabbed a really good one, but those two jump out at me as looking like twin cells. Okay, and then there's five slides. So you'll do all five slides. I'm looking now to see if there is, if I could have grabbed, oh, this looks like a good telephase. So right here, you can see these nuclei are like squished together yet. Ooh, here's a good one. Look, the cell plate is just starting to form. It's not all the way across. That's a beautiful telophase. Metaphase, 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 lots of metaphase. Okay. So then that's part of it. And then the other part is going to be um, some math. So you're going to um, calculate the percent of the um, cell cycle. So there's 500 total cells, 440 of them are in interphase. So I can divide 400, I should probably have reordered this. 440 divided by 500 is gonna be my percent, okay? The time spent, percent times, the whole cycle takes 625 minutes. So I would do percent times, um, 625 to find out the times. So this this would probably look better and you are welcome to switch if um, if we put percent here and then time there. And on the lab it does um, on this on this lab it does show you um, how to calculate the time. So this would give you the percent of cells and this would give you the time. Okay. So uh, what questions do you have about that? You can, um, it's up to you. If you guys want to all just go your separate way and do this on your own, or if you feel like, you know, in a lab, you'd work with a few people. Um, if you wanted to stick around and do breakouts, we can put you with your buddies and, um, and you guys could work together on it, whichever you prefer.